I want you guys to imagine a hypothetical Zerg against Zerg with two players with uh, vision turned on. So uh, they can see exactly what the other player is doing. They are just going to mirror it because you would never want to build links if uh, you can't get any damage on the links because they can just build their own links like one drone later and be up on economy. You would never get any damage on doing that. So Zerg against Zerg is pretty worked out. There's uh, the optimal unit comp is muters, uh, the optimal gas timing is known, so Zerg and Zerg is a very worked out matchup. If you had perfect vision, you would just play the matchup perfectly. Oh, one second. Hey buddy, daddy's streaming. Sorry guys. <laughs> okay. So uh, they're going to mirror the builds perfectly. The only uh, difference would be that like some of the players, one of the players would be better than the other. They would have uh, better micro and they'd win a Scourge Mutalist fight, they'd have better macro, they'd hit the overall timings, they'd build their drones on time. So what you'd end up with is a graph that looks like this, where the sort of the amount of power the army has, the amount of map presence they have, how, how strong they are, would be perfectly even across time. The red line and the blue line follow each other exactly. It's a complete mirror, right? So... That's the introduction to the uh, concept we're going to try and explain, is that uh, this game that we're talking about here would be decided purely by skill. The builds are completely identical. There's no difference between what the players are doing. They have perfect information. The player with the better macro and micro would pull ahead just by that. So what we've invented here is the uh, real-time clicking things genre of games. Not a real-time strategy game. There's no strategy involved. The strategy has been solved. It's been fully optimized. It's just real-time clicking things. Uh, the optimal unit comp is known, the uh, constraint is going to be the gas, that's known, the build order that optimizes the gas is known. So it's just whoever's better at clicking wins the game. No strategy involved because the strategy has been solved. Uh, that is not how Brood War works. It is not played with perfect information. It is a, a strategy game, not a clicking game. The uh, Brood War strategy game, the players make decisions, uh, each decision is a compromise with trade-offs. You have to uh, come up with the optimal build against a variable of estimated range of opposing builds. So you don't have perfect information, you don't know if they are... They, you, don't know what, you don't know what's behind the bunker in a PVT, you don't know if it's a CC necessarily or if it's a, a two-fact. If you don't get the scouting information you can't know, so you have to say, okay, I think that... 70% uh, of the time it's a uh, CC, 30% of the time it's a two-fact. The optimal build against that is something that has utility, or has, has options against a, uh, a two-fact, like a two-gate reaver, but is not super behind against a CC. So you're trying to come up with a, a build that is the highest expected value against the probability weighted range of builds they can be on. And uh, yeah, uh, you can scout to narrow down the range. You can uh, you can work out you can rule out builds that they're on. You can uh, run a goon past the bunker. You can confirm the CC. But every time you commit resources to scouting, there's a trade-off. You're you're weakening what you can actually do against their uh, their range. So uh, if you consider the uh, the Protoss economic cheese one dragoon nexus four gate mass dragoon. You can uh, scout that if you build a quick observer, but because you built a quick observer, you can't actually kill it. The observer that reveals what they're doing is the reason why you don't have a reaver, so you can't reaver push it. Uh, so solving Brood War is solving these puzzles where you have to optimize against a variable range and you have to come up with the, the correct probability weighted uh, estimate of what they could be doing and then the correct counter build that deals with everything in their range and you might have like a 60% chance against 40% of the range, a 70% chance against 20% of the range, and so forth. And only by multiplying the probabilities times the, uh, the win percents can you get the expected value of your, your counter build. This is uh, also exactly how poker works, which is why uh, in the mid-2000s all of the uh, StarCraft players just went to poker and just dominated it. Like, it, it changed the poker scene forever because Poker hadn't been properly solved yet. It hadn't been approached by a series of uh, obsessive teenagers who were just going to work it out. It was a bunch of old people who, who were like, oh, I played poker for 50 years and this is how I've always done it. Anyway, 
yeah, that's uh, like Elki, uh, Rekvil, uh, I think Guillaume uh, played some. Uh, Yellow famously lost a lot of money playing poker, but he was uh, <laughs> doing a lot of poker. Uh, even in the UK scene where I was uh, familiar with it, uh, Midian, uh, Wit Starcraft for poker, Ket, uh, uh, Zelen. I played poker for a few years. It's, that's, it's the same game. It's the same game. Okay. So, now let's uh, consider an uh, example of uh, trade-offs, where one player is uh, ahead in their build. So, 12-hat uh, uh, opening Zerg against Zerg versus 9-pool. So, the 12-hat uh, opener, you are weaker because you have no lings for a while, but then your second hatchery finishes and you make a shitload of lings from two hatcheries and you get ahead, right? It's very simple. Whereas the uh, one hatchery build, you're building links non-stop, you're not, the number of links just increase in linear power. So right now you're ahead, over here you're behind. What this means is that uh, the, uh, the nine pool player is ahead only if he attacks. If he doesn't attack, he loses the game, but if he attacks right now he wins the game. The second hatchery, uh, it, it exposes you to timings over here, but it also wins you the game over here. So there's a trade-off. There's a vulnerability, but there's a payoff. And as long as they can, they can get away with it, they will be ahead and they will win the game. But if they, they are attacked, they will lose. And then of course, uh, this is what it looks like if these uh, nine pool player just attack. They just, it doesn't get to the part where the second hatchery kicks in and that player just gets a shitload more lings. The uh, the speed or the ling opening just kills the hatchery, wins the game. So, you get your investment, you take your sacrifice, you get your payoff, or you uh, make your sacrifice, but you're too far behind, they attack, you don't get the payoff. That very familiar, very simple example that happens in Zerg and Zerg is every decision in the game. We're very familiar with it in Zerg and Zerg because it's so obvious 9 pool against 12 hat 11 pool is something that we're very very familiar with where we say okay the uh, 12 hat player is, is gonna lose because even though the 9 pool player is behind on economy and is behind on unit production there's a timing and they will just uh, they won't be able to get their, their economy kicking in. They won't be able to win with what they have. They have to uh, they, they will just die before that happens. So the player with the greater army power is going to use that to, to punish the opponent. The player who's gone for the investment, the investment's not going to pay off. Every single decision that you make in a game of StarCraft works the exact same way as that. Uh, so every single game, in every single moment, you will either be the 12 hat 11 pool player who's getting ahead over time but is vulnerable, or the 9 pool player who has a bigger army, but can only win the game by getting some value out of having that bigger army. It's If the 9 pool player doesn't attack the hatchery, he's fucked. So as a, as a 9 pool player, you'd never just not attack the hatchery. You would always, always attack the hatchery because you know that you're going to lose the game if you don't. That's the situation for everything. It's not as severe. It's not as drastic. It's not as obvious as 9 pool against 12 hat. But it is, it's universal. So, uh, yeah, there are no inherently good or bad decisions. All come with upsides and risks. There are only players that are plus EV or negative EV. Expected value. And whether a player is plus EV or negative EV depends on the specific game state and opponent. Something that may be an acceptable risk in one game may be an unacceptable risk in a different game because the opponent is different. Uh, or in a Zerg and a Zerg where they uh, first scout you, the overlord goes into your base uh, and they can just see everything they're doing and you, you can't see theirs a play might be bad, whereas the exact same play might be a very good play if the inverse happens, if you overlord scout them. Uh, my suggestion that uh, there are no inherently good or bad decisions, I mean there are some decisions that are obviously going to be negative EV almost all the time. I'm not saying that let's do whatever you like, it doesn't matter at all. Do plus EV plays, there are some plays that are just so irrational they would almost always be negative EV. But it's not because they're inherently bad plays, it's because there's always going to be better plays. There's always going to be a better way of getting to the same point. Okay. So, 
if we assume that strategy is entirely neutral, if both players are are playing a strategy that is identical, like the uh, the two Zergs with perfect information in the first example, where they just do mirror builds, they both build muters, then uh, the player who has uh, superior macro and micro and whatever will slowly get ahead and they will say, ah yes, this is what the game looked like, even though we were doing the exact same thing, there were no curves in this line. I slowly gained an advantage because I was just doing it better. I'm the better player, I deserve to win the game. So players who think about this, the game without thinking about strategy at all, they're thinking purely about execution. Their optimal strategy is a neutral strategy. It is a strategy that doesn't get them ahead or behind. And they think that that is what the game should be like. Uh, they think that the better player in terms of execution will win in a strategy neutral situation. And so they are aiming for a strategy neutral situation. Or sometimes they're even aiming for a uh, like a unfavorable strategy situation where they are accepting the opponent is getting advantages, they are playing extra safe, but they believe that they can compensate for that safety and that for the deficit that safety gives them with their SPA execution. Uh, these players don't understand strategy games, so this is just this is just bad. It's uh play something else if you're gonna play like this. So uh these players, in terms of uh, these lines, they are thinking that you always want your line to be above their line. Because if your line's above their line, you have a greater army power, you are safe, you cannot be attacked. Uh, they're not going to bust you. So they are always trying to keep their line above the opponent's line. They're always trying to have more stuff at all times in the game through their better uh, execution, through their better micro and macro. Uh, they, they're not thinking about it in terms of trade-offs, they're not thinking about trying to optimize your power at a certain point, they are just thinking about uh, trying to be safe, trying to make sure that they have more stuff, and then waiting for something to happen where they eventually win the game. Uh, however, I believe that that's actually the opposite way of playing. You do not want your line to be, that, be above their line, you want your line to be below their line for as long as possible, and below their line by as much as possible, because that way you get this situation where this, the uh, 12 hat 11 pool player, their line is a lot below the 9 pool players until suddenly it kicks in and they've just won the game. They have too much production, there's nothing the other player can do. If the 9 pool uh, Ling player does not attack, if the uh, 12 hat 11 pool player is not punished, he just wins. So having your line above their line means that you have not made as much investment as you should have. It means you are playing too safe. It means that you are not getting the yields in terms of tech and uh, economy that you should be getting. You want your line to actually be below their line. That is where you are aiming for. Not necessarily a long way below their line, but enough. Enough that you're always paying off. So, uh, yeah, if you can uh, do this, if you can have your line be below their line because you're making investments in tech or uh, economy or whatever, and then you just overtake them and you win. Because the blue player, even though he, his line's above, even though he has more power, he's not attacking. He is, the red player's not getting punished for this. The blue player is, has a bigger army, but the bigger army's staying home. It's exactly like the, the nine pool against 12 out 11 pool if the nine pool player doesn't attack. It's... As I keep saying, that's a very obvious, very drastic example where you're like, well, of course the 9-pool player would always attack. But every game has a 9-pool player in it. Every game there's one player who is ahead on army, behind on economy, behind on tech, and is not uh, getting compensated for that. It's only worth having your line be above theirs if you are being compensated. If you're not being compensated, you've just done it badly. You've just played it wrong. And that's how I approach the game. You want to be uh, weak in them at all points in the game that you're not getting punished. Because that is how you, you get the spike where you win. Yeah, here red is ahead, but uh, he's getting no value out of it, which means he's actually behind. Over here, uh, blue suddenly overtakes red because uh, blue wasn't punished. But then blue does nothing with that advantage. Blue doesn't uh, punish red at all, so red just takes a hidden expansion, comes straight back into it and so forth. If you're playing like this, these players are making mistakes. Every time their line is above, they are making mistakes. 
They should be doing punishing, they should be constraining the opponent, and they're just not doing it. Yeah, anytime your power line rises above that opponent, you should be asking, what value am I getting from this stronger army? What is the... Uh, what am I getting out of this? Am I uh, attacking the opponent? Am I uh, like constraining their build in any way? Because if you're not, you're, you're, just, you're like the 9 pool player who doesn't attack. Obviously in a 9 pool versus a 12 hat game, it's very obvious who is who. The 9 pool player knows that he has the stronger army, he is ahead in army power right now, and he has to attack or the inverse is going to happen. And the 12 hat player knows the same. The 12 hat player knows he has to defend, he has to hold on to his economy, and he has to hold on to his unit production facilities so that he can recover it. So everybody in a 9 pool versus uh, 12 hat knows the, the role they're playing. They know who they are, they know what they have to do. It's much harder to identify who you are and what you have to do in, in other scenarios, but the other scenarios are still the exact same concept. One of you is a 9 pool player, one of you is a 12 hat 11 pool player. You need to work out which one you are and what to do about that information. Uh, you don't necessarily need to attack to constrain the build of opponent. An attack is like a classic example of it because you you physically destroy their expansion, you deny them the benefit of their expansion. So like going over there and killing their units, killing their buildings, obviously that's getting damage. But making them not build an expansion is just as good as killing an expansion. It's still it's still denying them the resources. Or uh, if you delay the purposes of their build, if they're going for a uh, a build that has a specific timing on it, like a uh, Four pack, uh, no academy, uh, no army, TVP, and you build a DT, then even if your DT doesn't kill them, it's uh, very much damaged their build because of all of the sacrifices they've made to, to hit that timing. They're getting no compensation for that. They built all these units, they've delayed their plus one attack, they have no armory, and a single DT just denied their entire build. So that's damage. Uh, there's many, many different kinds of damage. Uh, Similarly, by showing your potential, you can uh, do damage, like a uh, TVZ where you move out your bio early in the game to force them to build Sarkin colonies. It doesn't matter if you never had the intention to attack the Zerg. It doesn't matter if you never even had the ability to attack the Zerg. You force them to make an adjustment, and uh, that's damage. Other thing I want to note is that the last thing you want to do uh, when you force them to make an adjustment is to actually justify that adjustment, to give it value. So PVZ, you've got four I early. Uh, I was watching Quark. Oh, we're getting raided. Nice. I was like, holy shit, this guy knows so much more than me. Thank you, Barnif. That's very kind. And uh, Azi Dahaki, thank you for the raid. Okay, so very common PVZ situation. Uh, you're getting your plus one. You're getting your speed, but you don't have them yet. You move out with four slow zealots. Uh, you do this because. If the Zerg doesn't build any Zerglies, you can go do some damage, but they will always build Zerglies because they're always going to see it with an Overlord. Those Zerglings have a very limited uh, window for where they have value. Once plus one speed lots are done, the uh, Zerglings are like they're very low value because the Zealots will just massacre them. So they're only valuable in the context of being able to deny the four speed lots or the sl four slow Zealots damage. If you send the four Zealots across the map and the Zerglings fight them and the Zerglings kill them, those Zerglings were a good decision by the Zerg. There was a risk, the Zerglings dealt with the risk, the Zerglings killed the thing. Great job. If the four Zealots turn around and go home, those Zerglings were a waste of money. So the damage is that uh, you've denied the opponent uh, the value that they were looking for out of the decision they were making. They, they sacrificed to get those Zerglings. The Zerglings came at compromise, they slowed down the fourth hatchery, they were drones that weren't built. But uh, if they kill Zealots, then great, it was necessary, it was worthwhile, it was a good decision. Early on today, I was watching... Oh, Quark. another raid. And I was like, holy shit, this guy knows so much more than me. So yeah, we, are, uh, we actually have control over whether their plays were good or bad. If you send the four Zealots, then their uh, Zergling play was a good play. It was necessary, it got value. If you don't send the Zealots, it was a mistake. You can control, you can decide whether their plays are mistakes. So uh, yeah, make as many of the mistakes as possible. Okay, so how to do this? Uh, first thing you need to do is scout. You need to scout constantly, you need to scout meaningfully. 
That's why I do 25 Robo Observer as PVT, because my PVT is built around getting an Observer into the base around 6 minutes 20. I do a very, very flexible opener. I go, I go for the two base setup, so it's extremely flexible. Uh, I have normally like three gateways, but the gateways aren't producing units. I have a probe at a third base, but the probe at the third base hasn't placed a nexus. Once the observer gets in, I can go in any direction I like. I can uh, go into storm. I don't need to go arbiter. I can go into third base and fourth base. I can build a shitload of units out my gateways. But I'm waiting until I have that scanning information, and I'm building. I'm using a build that is very, very flexible. In PvP, you uh, you should be using the dragoon early game to go. I check their natural because a dragoons can't really die to anything. And you should be looking for their range timing. You should be checking see their valley because sometimes uh, they'll just if they go to gate and you haven't seen the second gate, you go near their valley and you see there's an extra Dragoon, and you think, okay, the only way there could be an extra Dragoon is if they had a second gate, right? Or PVZ, uh, you got a probe inside the base early, you're looking at the gas time, and you're saying, okay, a 2.30 gas after a 12.11 uh, is, uh, well, a 2.30 gas over an overpool is gas before third hat. A 2.50 gas is third hat, then gas. Like, that kind of thing. It's... Uh, you got to you got to scout constantly. You got to scout meaningfully. Once you've scouted, you need to update the the uh, weighted probability range that you are putting them on. Uh, you are maintaining a uh, mental picture of the different builds they could be on, and how likely you think each one is. So, uh, let's say you have no scouting information at all, and they. Uh, Zerg and Zerg, sorry, the uh, against Zerg. And you just say, okay, 50% of the time it's going to be free hat Hydra, 50% of the time it's going to be uh, uh, free hat Lair, Spire, 6 hat Hydra. Like the mo two most common builds. So you have to come up with a build that's good against both of those, which is hard to do. You would much rather know which is more likely. You would much rather have some kind of way of narrowing that down. Uh, and there's things that you can, do that will tell you. It doesn't necessarily tell you exactly what they're doing, but uh, in a PvP, if they place their second pylon near the ramp, and that's all you see, you can still think, okay, I'm going to switch it from being like 50% Robo, 50% DT, to 70% Robo, 30% DT, because a pylon near the ramp, that normally implies that he's trying to do some kind of slow reaver expand. That's why you build it near the ramp. So, you update the probabilities. You, you don't know, you haven't seen anything, you haven't confirmed anything, but 50-50 no longer seems appropriate, 70-30 maybe that's more likely. And 70-30 changes the counter build, because the counter build is uh, success weighted as well as probability weighted. You're looking for the build that has the highest expected value, which is the chance of success, times the probability of the scenario where that is successful. So yeah, it's, uh, you have to constantly update your probability weighting of their range based on what you've seen. You also have to update your probability weighting of what they're doing based on what they've seen. So uh, you're in a PVT, you place your second pile on like right at the edge of your uh, main base to scout for drops or whatever, and the SCV doesn't see it. The SCV does however see that you have three probes on gas and that your core is not spinning. When it went for your natural, uh, there, it didn't see a nexus there because there was no nexus at the time, it runs into the main, Dragoon pops out, kills the SCV, and it doesn't see that you've actually sent a probe and taken your nexus. Your opening here is actually very, very standard. It's like a 21 next, 22 next, that kind of thing. It's a rangeless expand. Very normal PVT opener. But the Terran player, you think about it from their perspective, they haven't seen a second pylon, they've seen three probes on gas, they've seen no Dagoon range, and they didn't see a Nexus. They're thinking Foxy DTs. Right? They're thinking some kind of weird Foxy Robo Reaver rush play. So with that in mind, they are not as likely to do a free tank push, because a free tank push is not going to have a good time against a Foxy DT. So when you think, okay, we've confirmed that they've gotten like a factory expand, there's a bunker there, what's their follow-up going to be? Are they going to go one factory armory, or are they going to go two factory, then armory? Are they going to go double machine shop into the free tank push? Where are their minds going to go? Are their minds going to be out on the map denying expansions, or are their minds going to be next to their bunker? trying to play defensively against the DT. You can probably take a third Nexus more quickly because of what they've seen. Because the odds of being punished have gone down. It's uh, taking a quick third Nexus, like in Polypro, taking the high ground one or something like that. Uh, 
that can get punished if you uh, take it before adding too many gateways normally. But they're less likely to punish it because they're thinking DTs. They're not definitely thinking 100% DTs, but DTs are in their mind. It's in what they, they are placing in your range. The probability of DTs has gone up, and so the probability of free tank push has gone down, which means that your optimal build has shifted. The EV of going for a uh, quick third base has, has gone up because the probability of being punished has gone down. And then, of course, there's the I know that they know that I know that they know rabbit hole, where... Uh, you scout something that is a uh, that has a hard counter. So you scout. Uh, uh, let's think of a. <laughs> let's say you scout a free hat hydra uh, build. You see them place the uh, hydra den with your probe. So uh, they think you're going to count hi counter hydras, and so because they think that uh, you think uh, they're going hydras, they might not actually go hydras because. They think that uh, that you know that they're going Hydra, so they're going to uh, not go Hydra because obviously you're going to counter Hydra, so Hydra's aren't going to work. So it's uh, there's a lot going on here in terms of uh, what you're thinking and the things that influence the ranges and the EVs. It's not just the range that you're putting them on; it's the range that they're putting you on. That inf that impacts the EVs of very different builds. Okay. How to play like this part two. You've got to identify your ultimate win conditions. You've got a reasonable idea of where their build is going and how they're intending to win the game. So a TVP where they're just going for a uh, factory expand, one factory armory uh, into three factory uh, starport, science facility, uh, place a CC in main to float out, uh, place a second armory, 2-1. They're, they're telegraphing that they're just going to play a slow macro game. So you need to have a path to victory that includes that. You know where they're going, you know how they're trying to win. You need to either calculate a path that has the combination of economy, unit comp, tech that defeats what they're doing, or you need to calculate a path to get to ensure that they can't get where they're going. That's, uh, you gotta keep your eye on the win condition. You gotta say, okay, this is where they're going. How do I beat that? Other way around, loss conditions. Uh, Imagine you lose the game and you're reviewing the replay to work out what happened. Uh, you see in a certain point in the replay they take a hit and expand, you're like, well, I could have killed that at any time. I could have just walked across the map, sent a probe out, found it, and they could never have defended that. You don't actually need to wait for the replay to do that. You can do that during the game. You can, in the game, think, okay, I'm very far ahead. If I was to lose this, what went wrong? And then, uh, yeah, just don't have it go wrong. Easy as that. Uh, you want to rearrange the order of builds for an advantage. So uh, let's say it's PvP on a ramp map, and you're going for a Dragoon Reaver push timing. Uh, so to make that push work, you're going to need both Dragoon range, some Dragoons, and Reavers. But the thing that is limiting when you can actually attack is not your Dragoon range. You could get Dragoon range several times over in the time it takes to get Robo, Support Bay, Shuttle, and Reaver. The uh, constraint is the time it takes to get your Reavers and get them across the map and get them to your opponent. You're not going to attack before the Reavers are done under any conditions, so you don't need Dragoon range early. You have a ramp, you're safe, you're not going to lose to a Dragoon range push. So uh, bring the Robo forward, push the Dragoon range back. As long as you line them up so they're both ready when you need them, then you're good. So you want to get the things that you need when you need them, and not when you don't need them. Which comes back to our line, I'm just going to... So uh, let's say Blue is a Protoss who's uh, not getting Dragoon range, and Red is a Protoss who is getting Dragoon range. Blue didn't need Dragoon range. Red wasn't attacking him. Blue is perfectly happy to be have this deficit down here. He doesn't care. It, as long as Red doesn't punish, he's happy to have ranged Dragoons against ranged Dragoons. Because that way he can get his Robo finished. Robo and Dragoon range both finish at the same time and suddenly Blue's ahead. Because you, you get the things when you need them and not the things you don't need when you don't need them. Uh, other way around, uh, don't rearrange the order of your build for a disadvantage. So it's a PVT, uh, they already have three marines in a bunker, they have a Vax at the front kind of blocking your Dragoons, and you notice that the Vax is flush flashing. You notice that they are building marines even though they have no need for marines defensively. Might not be the time to skip range. That might be a situation where you want range, because uh, they're probably building these marines for a reason, there's probably a, uh, 
a two pack behind it, they're probably going for some kind of push. So, yeah, rearrange the order builds for an advantage and don't suck it up. Uh, last point is don't play lost games out to a loss. Uh, let's take the example of a Zerg and a Zerg where they have more muters than you, so they have air control, and they also have more gas income than you. If you keep building muters and they keep building muters, you are never going to win that because even though you're playing it in a standard way, normally as a Zerg, the Zerg, Zerg, Zerg and Zerg, you're just building muters, you're just trying to win with Muter Micro, you know that that's not going to happen this game. That ship has sailed. So, uh, yeah, don't, uh, don't play standard games out to a guaranteed loss. You know you're going to lose them. You know where this game's going. It's already been decided. Uh, just go for the uh, high risk, uh, low probability play because is a low probability play is better than no play at all. In a PvP, go for a DT drop. Or if that matter, PvZ, go for a DT drop. Most of the time, there'll be an overlord. The DT will uh, get scouted, and all that's happened is you've like, flown a shuttle into some scourge and you're dead. But you were already dead. Doesn't actually hurt you at all. You were never going to win that game. You knew you were never going to win that game with standard play. So fuck it. Build a DT, put it in a shuttle, fly it in. Maybe you get lucky. Better than uh, playing out to a loss. Playing out to a game that you've already lost just to, uh, to like show everybody how the game develops under a normal condition is a waste of everybody's time. If you're going to do that, just straight up GG. Okay. So key points. Uh, Keep your mind on the ultimate win and loss conditions. Uh, expected value can only be judged with respect to how it gets you to those. So the expected value of a play that doesn't actually uh, get you any closer to your ultimate win condition is probably not great. Uh, let's say that uh, you're playing a PVT, the Terran uh, takes a third base and you fly in with a bunch of uh, slow zealots in shuttles, drop them on tanks, move your dragoons in and you deny their third. Maybe even kill the CC. You, they're not going to leave that game. They have their upgrades coming, so uh, you've actually hurt yourself by doing that. The expected value of that play was probably negative, because you've hurt your economy, you've hurt your tech timings. You're no closer to your ultimate win condition, which is that uh, you have like maxed out carriers and all the base on the map. You have gotten no closer to that. However, they are closer to their ultimate win condition, because their upgrades are still going behind this. They've lost their third, but they can retake their third. Their win condition is based on upgrades. So uh, the EV of the play, even though you won the battle, was probably negative. You probably, uh, if you thought that was a good play, you're probably judging it incorrectly. You don't care about battles, you care about the war. Yeah, the EV is only judged with respect to how it uh, improves your ultimate win conditions and uh, denies your loss conditions. Secondly, uh, you're going for plus EV plays, not risky plays. You are not coin flipping. You are not just uh, going to a casino and saying, okay, put everything on red, see what happens. Because going to a casino, putting everything on red, that's negative EV. There's a, there's a zero on the roulette wheel. You're not just trying to sometimes win and sometimes lose. The risk is weighted by the game state derived probability to calculate the EV, and only if the EV is positive do you make the play. Uh, don't do negative EV plays, even if they appear safe. Uh, the relative safety is offset by the probability weighted advantage you give to the opponent by playing safely. Uh, let's say you uh, rush Academy in, as a Terran and you get your two commsats and you scan them and you confirm there's nothing weird going on. That costs you four SCVs, right? It's a very classic example of uh, playing safe versus uh, taking a bit of risk and getting a stronger economy. So, uh, yeah, the, the probability weighted advantage that you get from uh, the play has to be worth the, uh, the cost. Playing safety for the sake of safety will put you behind. Uh, to make your plus EV plays and avoid your negative E plays, you know, must know how to read the game state. You can only do two and three if you can read the game state. Uh, you've got to know what's in your opponent's range. You've got to be able to identify the key opportunities to narrow their range. So, uh, you got to know when to scout, what to look for, and what your scouting information means. And that is a very, very broad point. It depends a lot on the player, the map, the matchup, the skill level, and so forth. So if you scout there are three SCVs uh, on gas in, early in a TVP, it might mean it's a two-fact. might mean you're playing a D-Rank Terran. Could be either. 
Uh, similarly, if you're like pressuring a bunker with ranged dragoons and no tank shows up, maybe they've uh, delayed their tank so they can use their gas to get a quick starport. Maybe they just supply blocked on 44 out of 44 and their tank is going to show up later. It's, uh, and again, it could be either. But you have to be uh, like knowing what to look for, knowing to scout with your Dragoon in a PvP, go up to their natural, see if you can take a look. Because if you can see their natural, you can, uh, you can see there's no Nexus there, then uh, you can narrow their range, you can rule out quick Nexus. If you look at their natural and you see there's a pylon there, suddenly it's a lot more likely they're doing a DT expand with cannons, because the pylon needs to be placed there for that. Uh, you've got to know what your range of builds uh, that you can, your range of counter builds are, and how each performs against everything in their range. You've got to know that uh, uh, if you open, as I like to open, uh, like 25 Robo PBT, and then if I haven't confirmed a CC, going to three gateways by 30, I need to know how that plays against a two fac, and also how it plays if they did have a CC. The impact of cutting the probes against a CC versus the impact of uh, having three gateways kick in uh, at that point against a two fac. Yeah, you have to know all of the different things in your range of options and also their probability so that you can ca calculate the EV. So you can calculate whether you're ahead and be or behind, what the win chance is with everything in your range against everything in their range, so you can work out which is the optimal one. You also got to know what your opponent knows about your range. You've got to place yourself in their shoes and calculate what, the opt what their optimal option against your range is or against the range they have assigned to you. So... Uh, that's the uh, point I made earlier, the, uh, the Terran who uh, doesn't see range, doesn't see a second pylon, is thinking that it's DTs. You place yourself in their shoes and you think, they probably aren't going to do a uh, free tank push because a free tank push isn't a very high win rate against the range that they think you're on. And so you recalculate uh, the probabilities in their range and then you recalculate the EV of your the different builds in your range against those new probabilities based on what you think the opponent's doing. And what you think the opponent's doing is a lot about what they think you're doing. The opponents generally are doing the thing that makes sense. But you have to know what makes sense based on what they've seen. Okay. And we're going to close with this, which I just thought was funny. <laughs> This player on the left is uh, obsessed with mechanics. They're like, well, I was uh, strategy shouldn't be a factor. I was I was tapping the same piece over and over and over and over and over. I was doing lots and lots of actions. Yes, the actual moves I was making weren't correct, but you know, there was a lot of activity going on. I'm happy. Player on the right is like, buddy, you haven't learned a fucking thing. You keep losing the exact same way over and over and over. What's going on? So yeah, uh, I just thought it was funny. And that is your lesson. Any questions? Okay. Simple as that. And that because I'm going to stop this recording and I will throw it on YouTube later. We're going to play some more StarCraft though.